All right. Like I said before, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. My name is Bruce Hubbard. I work at Differential, uh, which is just right across the street that way. Um, we mainly do web development using Meteor. Um, so my talk today is JavaScript Evolved, so the new spec, uh, ECMAScript 2015. Uh, on a personal note, today is actually my 15th wedding anniversary. This is, yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, my wife and my kids, so five of them. Um, on another personal note, one of my favorite movies is Idiocracy. Has anybody watched Idiocracy? Okay. So my wife and I always think we're like this couple. We're, we're smart, intelligent, but we have five kids. So what keeps me up at night is, am I closer to this guy? And it's funny because in this GIF, like, he has five kids in this one. So that keeps me up at night. Am I Cleavon or am I the smart couple? Anyway, on to JavaScript. <laughs> um, probably if you've been around JavaScript long enough, you've seen this before. JavaScript, the definitive guide, and it's this huge, huge book. And then you have JavaScript, the good parts, and it's this little. That's what most people think of JavaScript. Um, it's kind of been a laughing stock for a long time, and it's mainly survived because it, it's how the web, work, how the web runs. Um, it's a little history. Basically, you know, it evolved um, somewhere in the late 90s, and then it didn't change for like 10 years. Um, they tried to improve JavaScript, but uh, ES4 got abandoned. Finally, around 2009, they said maybe we should actually do some work on this, and you know, it started to evolve finally. Um, but since the language was so stagnant for so long and it was such a laughing stock, um, a lot of other languages started popping up. Well, since we can't fix JavaScript, let's start compiling things down to JavaScript. So JavaScript became a compile target for a long time. Um, CoffeeScript, TypeScript, and there are about a million other ones, ClojureScript. Um, but now with ES6, which I think they've officially renamed ES2015. They're planning on going to the year because I think they're actually planning on doing, iterating yearly on the language now. Um, it won't be as much of a laughing stock. Um, but for a long time, it made a lot of sense to go with something like CoffeeScript or some other language just because JavaScript sucks so bad. So is anybody here using CoffeeScript right now? OK. Stop it. Unless you have to, of course, with you know older code, you kind of you know you kind of live with it. But my opinion is you should not be writing new CoffeeScript unless you're, of course, editing old files. Um, but first, let's go into why we actually used CoffeeScript. Like I said, JavaScript sucks, or it has sucked for a long time. And I actually love JavaScript. It's one of my favorite languages. Um, but I but I'm willing to admit it sucks. Is that pizza? Yep. Yes, CoffeeScript round two. So I was just talking about the reasons why we used CoffeeScript. Um, if you ever, if you ever tried to do object-oriented programming in JavaScript, as soon as you saw CoffeeScript, you're like, all right, I'm using CoffeeScript. Um, just simple things like string interpolation, um, scoping, hoisting, implicit returns. Basically, CoffeeScript is a lot more like Ruby, and I'm not sure if you're ever going to find any developer that's willing to argue that JavaScript's a better language than Ruby. Ruby pretty much beats it hands down. So co since CoffeeScript was more like Ruby, CoffeeScript kind of became de facto standard for a long time. So CoffeeScript was a really great stopgap. Since JavaScript sucked, we had this other thing. It does, it's a lot better, but now, with ES2015, um, sure, this one. Oh, I meant to say, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, ES2015 is a game changer. Um, it it narrows the gap between CoffeeScript and JavaScript a lot to the point where it's almost pointless to use CoffeeScript. All right, enough talking. Show me some code. Um, a lot of these examples I pulled from, this is 
probably the best site that I found that goes over um, ES6. Um, if you want to pop that, like if you have a laptop and want to pull it open, that's fine. Um, but it, it basically, actually I have it up, I can show you. It gives you a nice uh, list on the left hand side of all the features. And if you click on one, it'll give you how to write it in ES6 versus how you had to write the equivalent code in ES5. Um, it's a really excellent website. Basically, when I, when I switch from CoffeeScript over to uh, ES6, I, um, I use this site all the time. Like, I constantly, I had it open in Chrome all the time. I have not referring to it as much now that I'm starting to get the ropes, but it definitely was helpful when I started out. All right. So, pop quiz. And uh, what is this print? And never write code like this. But you so say you have var j equals negative one, and then you have a for loop. And inside your for loop, you say var j equals i plus one. So when it gets out of that loop, and you console.log j, what does j equal? Is it negative one, or is it, what, five? Any guesses? It's not. It, um, when you get out of it, it actually, it actually prints, yeah, five. And that's because JavaScript does something called hoisting. And so whenever you have code, um, since it's interpreted, when it interprets your code, any, any variable declarations that you have, it pulls them all the way up to the top. Um, so even though you declared J twice and one's inside a block scope, it actually just says, well, I know you declared it down here, but I'm going to move it all the way up here. Now, it won't, it won't move the initialization, like equals negative one. That stays in place, but it, it will move the declaration all the way to the top, which is a pain in the butt if you, like one time I had to spend a half an hour debugging somebody else's code because they were using a, a global variable that had the same name as a local variable. And so they were using the global variable, and then they were declaring another variable with the same name. Don't ever do that either. That's kind of dumb. But then they couldn't figure out why it was undefined when they were trying to use the global variable. Um, this is JavaScript problems right here. And this is why that good parts is so thin. Um, and also, if you, if you notice, JavaScript is not block scoped. Like most other languages, C type languages like Java and C Sharp, uh, almost every other language is block scoped. So if you have curly braces, those variables will only live inside those curly braces. Well, JavaScript is not that way. It's function scoped instead of block scoped. So everything inside a function has its own scope. But anything inside a block will actually live once you get outside the block. And this is why everybody laughs at JavaScript, because yeah, that doesn't work that way in, I think, any other language I've ever encountered. Um, so one of the new features is a new way of declaring variables. So, oh, this is the block scope stuff. So if true, curly brace var a equals foo, when you get outside of the block, you can console.log a, and it'll actually, it, it, it's foo at that point. Because like I said, it's, it's function scoped. So it just moves those, those variables up to the top um, same thing with a for loop inside a block. When you get outside, it prints uh, five. Um, so one of the ES6 features, and one of my favorites, is a new way of declaring variables. So instead of saying var, you can say let. And that basically, let, acts like every other language that you know. So it's block scoped. Um, it does not hoist. So when you say if true, let a equals foo, when you get outside and you try to console.log a, you get an error because it's undefined. Um, and same thing with a, with a loop. Basically anything that is declared with a let inside a block stays inside that block. So that makes it work like every other language that you've ever seen. So, my, so with all my code, I've basically, I stopped typing var. Like var was, I could type var so quick that it's just reflex, but now it's always let for me. Sure.
It's block scope. Yeah, it's block scope. Yep. Um, it'll work exactly how var always worked. Okay. The let is the new thing to be able to, to put it in Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, because, and I'm going to get to transpilers, but basically, you know, um, when you run this in an environment that doesn't have ES6 native, it compiles it to a var. Um, but then usually it wraps it in some kind of closure to make it work like it's block scoped. Um, but yeah. But depending on that implementation, obviously, you might get something different. But Yep. Um, another new feature of ES6 is we now have constants. We've never really had constants in JavaScript. Um, you can, so you can initialize a variable. Um, if you try to reassign it, it, it will have no effect. I'm pretty sure that's what the, what the browsers do now. I don't think it'll throw an error. I think it just has no effect. Um, you can declare a constant and then initialize it later, but you can only initialize it once. These are features that other languages take for granted that we're just now finally after like 15, 20 years getting in JavaScript. Um, so my favorite feature is definitely arrow functions. I use these a lot in CoffeeScript. Um, so just like I could type var in my sleep, I could type function in my sleep. Because you write it so many times when you're doing JavaScript. Um, so now you don't actually have to type function. You could, you could uh, do, basically it's almost the equivalent of fat arrows in CoffeeScript. So uh, in this, in this one, this example down on the bottom, you notice that the return keyword is omitted. If you have an inline function declared like this, it works just like CoffeeScript where it implicitly returns whatever the statement is. But this only works with one statement. If you want to do multiple statements, um, you, you have to use curly braces. So even if you use the arrow syntax, you still use curly braces and then you can use multiple um, statements, but then you have to use the keyword return. It's not like CoffeeScript where it implicitly returns whatever the last statement is. That only works with those single inline functions. And that's actually my biggest, uh, the biggest hiccup that I, that I find myself doing when I convert CoffeeScript to JavaScript is forgetting to type that word return. I'm like, why did this function return undefined? And then I go, oh yeah, I forgot the keyword return. Um, but another thing that the arrow function does that's not obvious at first is it actually changes, completely changes the scope of the keyword this. So if you've written JavaScript at all for, a, for any amount of time, you've seen var self equals this about a million times. Because every time you go, you have a new function, like this example on the top, when you get inside that function, you can't access the, whatever this was outside that function unless you, dec unless you assign it to a variable. Um, with the new arrow functions, whenever you do an arrow function, it actually inherits the context of what it, wherever it was declared. So in this case, you know, this.nums, dot for each, and then you have a function, you can say this.register, and it's the same this as the line up above it, um, which is good and bad. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of libraries that actually reset whatever this is. And this is another JavaScript. Like, you could write a book on just this in JavaScript. It's, um, depending on how you call a function, this is completely different. Um, it's also the most difficult thing to uh, Oh, it's, it sucks. This is one of the reasons why people hate JavaScript. Is because you're like, oh, you just use this. And in every other language, you know what this means. It's the object that you're on, whereas JavaScript, it could be anything. Um, but this, this helps some of the little um, you know, boilerplate code that we used to have to do before, you know, assigning this to a variable just so we can access it inside a function. Um, Go ahead. Where it's 
it's where it's declared. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, but you know, CoffeeScript has skinny arrows and fat arrows. This is kind of the equivalent of CoffeeScript's fat arrows. It, it does not have the equivalent of the skinny arrow. So skinny arrow in CoffeeScript works just like it does up, up above. It's just you don't have to write the word function. Um, but ES6 doesn't have the equivalent. So if you want this to be whatever it would have been in the old scenario, you have to write it the old way. All right, another feature that we finally have after 20 some odd years is uh, default arguments. So before in JavaScript, you can't really, in other languages you might overload a, f a function or a method to if you have you know, a method that might take one, two, or three parameters. You might overload it and then call one from the other. JavaScript really doesn't have that concept. So you would end up having to do basically just one function with three variables. And then if, if one of them is undefined, you would set it right there. Well, now, basically, it's just syntactical sugar. You can just say, you know, y equals seven right there in the parameter list. Again, this is not anything that's awesome and unique to JavaScript. This is just letting JavaScript catch up. So is that actually for YMC, is that still taking as variables, or is it defining? It means if you did not pass in, like, the third parameter, so it's, default, it's default, yeah. So you can still pass in different Yeah, and if you do, it'll be whatever you pass in. Yep, but if you don't pass it, then that'll be there. Um, string, interp string interpolation is another thing that's cool in CoffeeScript that's finally in JavaScript. My only complaint with this is you have to use backticks, so you can't just use quotes like you normally would. Um, like in CoffeeScript, it uses, you can use normal quotes and then you should use the pound sign and then curly brace. Well, they decided not to go with pound sign. Instead, you have to use the dollar sign and you have to use backticks. I'm sure they did this for backwards compatibility reasons, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. Like, I, my finger almost never goes back up, up the back ticks. Um, so I, I really don't, I don't like this feature as much, but I like string interpolation, but I don't like back ticks. Um, it's something like that. Yeah. I'm sure they had their technical reasons, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> Um, you can also do multi-line strings now with the backticks. Before, if you tried to do up a, the first example with, with just quotes, you would actually error out. Um, you know, you have to end, end the string and then use a plus. Now you can actually use backticks and you can have multi-line strings. Uh, it does, yeah. Yep. I don't know if I've... I don't use that very often, but... It's there. Yep. Um, all right. Has anybody ever tried to do object-oriented object programming in JavaScript? It's not straightforward. It's not something that you, if you're coming from any other language, you just pick up and say, oh, yeah, that's how it works. It's super easy and super simple. Um, because it's prototype-based, not it's not class-based. So this is the old way to do um, classes in JavaScript. See, so var shape equals function. Again, if you're coming from any other language, you're like, oh, you're declaring a class by using the word function. That doesn't make sense at all. Um, but basically, any function where you use the keyword this inside it becomes a class. Um, and then you can, you can edit the prototype of that class I'll put it in quotes. The second example is I'm adding a move function. And then the third example, I'm adding a, def a static method. Like, if you see this, and you're coming from any other language, this looks nuts. But it's something that we've dealt with a long time in JavaScript. Um, the new syntax is much cleaner. So we actually have the, word, the keyword class now. 
you can have a constructor. Because before, just the function body was the constructor, even though it may not be obvious. But we actually have something called a constructor now. And then you can, you can declare uh, member variables. It has the keyword static, where you can declare static methods and, um, and properties. So much, much cleaner, whether you actually do object. I've never done, I haven't done much object-oriented programming in JavaScript just because it's so functional based, like that, yeah. Tom Dale just did that whole, I would never hire anybody that did object-oriented programming or whatever. He had a blog post. I don't, I don't agree with some of it, but. I know, go, yeah, just go read that blog post. I don't know if he's trolling or what, but it basically, yeah. Yeah, it's Tom Dale. I don't, I don't see eye to eye on Tom Dale on a lot of things, because he doesn't like Meteor also, and obviously I love Meteor, but that's all right. And I actually don't like Ember at all, so eh, that's all right. All right, another quiz. Does anyone know how to do inheritance in JavaScript without cheating and looking at that site. Has anybody done? <laughs> Just the fact that we're talking about any of that is kind of stupid. All right, so this is inheritance. This is, I pulled this example straight off of that ES6 site. This is an example of inheritance in old JavaScript. So you have, a, you have a class called shape, then you have another class called rectangle. That constructor, even though it's not obvious it's a constructor, says shape.call, and shape.call and dot apply are different ways of setting this in JavaScript. That's a whole, we can do a whole session on that. Um, but then you have to do the, all this goofy stuff with the prototype. Again, if you're coming from any other language, you're looking at this saying, I'm never ever doing that ever. So the new ES6 syntax, you can actually, it has the keyword extends, so it works just like every other language that you've ever worked with. So you can have a class called shape, and you can have a class called rectangle, and it extends from shape. And it, you, it, now there's the keyword super. So. Yeah. Yep, pretty sure. I have, actually didn't read that, but that's a good question. I'm assuming it is, which would suck, but it is what it is. Um, so a couple other, couple other little features. Uh, has a new operator called rest slash spread. Um, basically, it's kind of like if you do C sharp, C sharp or Java. They, I think they have dot dot dot. Um, if you have a function and it has two arguments, and then you can let the third argument be dot, 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 and then whatever the variable name is, and then you can pass it as many arguments as you want, and everything after the second argument will, will be rolled up into A and be an array. Um, so in this case, we're calling F with one, two, A, B, C. So when that actually runs, obviously X will be one, Y will be two, and A will be an array containing A, B, C. Then it also works in the um, inverse, where if you have, a, you have an array, and you want to pass it, um, and you have a function that takes, say, five parameters, um, and you don't want to explicitly, like, say, param sub zero, param sub one, you can use the, um, and I'm used to calling it splat or whatever, but um, if you call a function with one, two, and then dot, 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 in an array, it actually will flatten that array out and pass them as individual parameters. That's not something that you're probably going to use every day, but it's there and it's new. Um, this actually, I like the top one. So we now have sets. This is another thing that people take for granted in other languages is data, data types and data structures. Um, we have these using certain libraries and everything, but now it's built into language. So you can say let s equals new set, and then you can add, first off, a set is a unique, it's basically like an array, but it's of unique values. 
So if you add hello, you add goodbye, and then you add hello. Um, if you look at the size, the size is only two because hello was a duplicate and it only contains unique values. Um, we now have a map data structure, which is slightly confusing because everybody's always used JavaScript objects in general as a map, basically a dictionary. Um, but we now have maps and they're called dictionaries. They're, I think they're called something different in every framework. Um, but you can set, it's basically a key value pair. Um, so you can set hello and set it to 42. Um, just typical stuff. I mean, none of this is, again, none of this is rocket science. This is just catching up. There's some new string methods. Um, repeat, so abc.repeat4, and it basically repeats itself four times. There's starts with, ends with, includes. Uh, new binary slash octal literals. Again, I'll probably never use this in a million years. We've always had hex, but now we have binary and octal. If you're doing any binary or octal, hey, this might save you a lot of, a lot of code or something. Um, property shorthands. This is semi-handy. So if you have variables, so var name, var company, and you want to assign that, like basically if you want to create an object with those um, variables, the old way in the middle, you could do var person equals name colon name company colon company. Now you can just say var person equals curly brace name company. And it figures that out for you. It goes, oh, that's a variable called name and that must be what you want the key to be. Um, that's something I will probably never remember. But, and then when I see it, I'll be confused and like, what the heck is that? Oh yeah, that's right. That's one of those property shorthand things. Um, you can also do things like have um, square brackets as the property, property name. So you can, they're basically dynamic um, property names. So prop, say you wanted this to be prop one. If you set i equals i to one, it, this would end up being prop one. Um, before you would have to, basically after you declare your object, you would have to go down below and do, do that. Um, also there's new shorthand for declaring functions, which is the second example. Before you would have to say hello, colon, function. Um, it basically just cuts out that colon and the keyword function. Everything else is the same. So again, it's just shorthand. Um, some other new cool things. There are now built-in promises to the language. Um, promises are a complicated subject. But basically, you know, instead of returning a value, if your function does something and it takes some time, instead you can return a promise. And then at the, so that's what this function does up above. And then you can say, you can call the function and then say dot then, which means after this function finally returns me a value, do this. Um, it's just a better way than before you get into callback hell with JavaScript where you, instead you would do callbacks instead of promises and then your code would end up looking like this because of all the nested um, nature of it. And it's got some cool utilities like promise.all. So you can actually say promise.all and then have an array, an array of promises, and it'll actually run all of those. And once all of the promises complete, then it will, then it'll run the whatever's in the then. And then in that case, data will be an array, and that array will be the results of all of your promises. Um, there's also promise.race, where you can pass it an array of promises and whichever one completes first was the one that it goes with. So it's just saying, do all this stuff and I don't care, I only want the first one that finishes. So in this case, the second one will be the one that gets put into data because it's only 100 milliseconds versus 400 and 800 milliseconds. No idea. I was trying to think of that too and I couldn't come up with one, but it's there in case you need it. Yeah, that could be.
Yeah, that's a good one. There you go. Jeff to the rescue. But yeah, so it's there in case you ever need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could be. Instead of doing it synchronously. Yeah. Um, there are now modules in ES6, and this also could be its own talk, probably. Um, but you can, and it's funny because the, the new spec isn't really compatible with any of the older specs, like uh, common JS, which is common in Node, or um, AMD, like require.js. Uh, this is a different syntax. Uh, but basically, so this is three different files. Um, the first one, lib slash math.js, um, you can export a function, you can export a variable, and then the second file in the middle, you can import things from that file up above. So right here it's importing everything as math from lib math. So then you can say math.sum or math.py, um, or in the bottom example, you can import specific features from, uh, from another file. So this is importing sum and pi. And instead of having to say math.py, you can just use the, the words sum and pi. Um, this is to help with namespacing and just, yeah, just a good idea in general. I'm not, I haven't really seen many people doing this yet. Has anybody seen much with this yet? New packaging? Modules? Is it? Okay. I don't do any Ember, so. So does that, I guess I'm, the thing it makes me think of is, does this automatically like pull in those like from remote sources and things like that? Or how does this impact like identification and concatenation and all that kind of stuff? are all good know? examples. I have not used this funk, uh, this at all. I threw it up here because it is different, but. Can you? I don't know if that's a really bad idea. Or I don't know. I mean, it, does it resolve those before it goes to the or does it do those when you execute something that requires it? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I think right now everybody just declares something in global scope and like, oh, hey, it's there for everybody. But this kind of helps with that, help with scoping. Yeah, yeah, like I said, this could be its own talk probably, just this feature. Um, and it's not something that we've used a lot because Meteor actually has its own packaging system and uh, yeah, every, everybody has its own packaging system. Every framework, doesn't it? It is, I know, that, that's, that's the thing, and that's why I put it on here is now there's a spec. So I think, I think it will, everything will slowly go this way, and it's just a matter of time. Yep. Um, there are a lot of other really cool things in ES6 that I didn't really feel like talking about, like generators. If you've done Python or some other languages have generators, I've never had, I've never had a problem where I'm like, oh, I could solve that with a generator. So I. I just stuck it on this last slide. It's kind of a, yeah. And then uh, proxying, it has some new reflection tools in the language. All right, so that's, that's kind of a rundown of, of the features. Like I said, um, if you go to that one site that I had, it, it does a lot better um, justice to it than I do. You can, you can see the before and see the after. So 
you may be sitting there the whole time thinking, well, I may not ever be able to use that because browsers suck and users don't upgrade their browsers. And so even though this is ES6, that I might not be able to use this for two or three years. Um, you know, are there any polyfills for this? When will I be able to use this? Um, so somebody came up with a brilliant um, idea of, hey, this is new JavaScript, why don't, and all the browsers run old JavaScript, so why don't we just compile the new JavaScript down to old JavaScript? And we've kind of been talking about transpilers already. Um, that's basically what it does. So um, the one that we use, and I think the one that's dominant, is called Babel. And what it does is it compiles ES2015 down to ES5. Um, that way, and it does a pretty good job with it, um, but that way it'll run on all the browsers, but you get to write the new JavaScript and you don't have to deal with the really the old JavaScript. Um, the first time I saw that, I said, that's illogical, that's kind of stupid, why would you do that? But after I kind of got used to it, I liked the idea. So my opinion now is you should be, you should stop writing CoffeeScript and you should be using Babel right now. Um, so the other website that I had pulled up if you go to Babel, and it's babeljs.io, um, it's got a great, if you click setup, basically you pick, you pick your framework, like Rails, and it'll tell you how to use it. So gem install sprockets dash ES6, and then it has some usage. For Meteor, it's Meteor add ECMAScript. So almost, almost all environments. I don't think there's one for .NET on here. But a lot of, um, like Visual Studio, I think has a plugin or some kind of plugin to, to compile it. Basically, you just need something sitting there compiling the new JavaScript down to old JavaScript. Um, but this, they do a good job with, uh, with getting you set up here. And if, if your framework of choice is not on this, you can Google it and probably somebody's already fought that battle. So it's my, it's my opinion that you should be using Babel today. Um, anything that's not in Babel right now, you can actually use plugins for. I haven't, I haven't had tons of needs for plugins, but um, basically they're refactoring all of Babel to be almost entirely nothing but a series of plugins. Um, so you can actually write you can introduce your own custom features to the language if you wanted, if you wrote your own plugin. Um, so if there's some new feature that JavaScript doesn't have, you could hypothetically just create it with a plugin. Um, so like I said, ES 2015 should be your default choice right now, not, not CoffeeScript, not anything else. And my reasoning is, what will your project look like in five years? Um, like I've already said, they're planning on iterating on JavaScript slash ECMAScript yearly now. So a lot of the excuse for using CoffeeScript was the margin between the languages was so wide. I mean, there's so many cool things in CoffeeScript that were not in JavaScript, but now it's not really, it's not really that way anymore. Like that, that margin's slimming. Um, there's still some things in CoffeeScript that don't have an equivalent in JavaScript, but I think it'll get there. Like they seem to be actually making progress now. Uh, so CoffeeScript was a great stopgap, but JavaScript is now your stopgap. Um, like I said, in Meteor, if anybody uses Meteor, you could just Meteor add ECMAScript. Uh, Meteor 1.2 automatically supports it out of the box. So if you just say, if you already have Meteor 1.2 and you say Meteor create my new project, you can start writing ES6. You don't have to do anything. It's there by default. Um, and then I will put these slides up on the web, and I'll send out a link. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was just going to ask about the Meteor uh, 1.2, are there any other sort of base systems? I mean, so does this support ES6? Or like, what, what supports ES6 today? Or, sorry, 2015 today? Yeah, I mean, almost anything, as long as you can get Babel set up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, natively, natively Chrome supports a lot of it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, most most of these. I think they all have some. Oh, okay. Yeah. It is, 
And I mean, IE is always there, and you always have to support some version of IE. Yeah, which is funny, isn't it? There will always be some browser that's lagging behind. <laughs> no. Yep. Yep, exactly. And a lot of that kind of take for granted because Meteor does, Meteor kind of takes care of that stuff. Because, I mean, Meteor is using Babel, so it's the same way. It just sets up all that. Yeah, exactly. Um, we just, we don't have to set it up. It just kind of automatically works. Uh, like I said, I'm going to put these slides up on online and I'll post a link to them in case anybody wants to look at them. Um, I'd also like to say, I've been coming to this group for four years or so. Um, and I would encourage people to just, uh, everybody here has something, something unique that they're working on or something that they could share. Definitely, I encourage everybody to speak. Um, we're not going to laugh at you guys. Or <laughs> so definitely, um, if you have a topic, no matter what it is, even if, if it's small, we can fit you in, maybe get two or three people to speak in a session. No matter what it is, everybody here has something to contribute to this group, and it makes this group awesome. Don't just be here for the pizza. And so, uh, once again, I'm Bruce Hubbard. We're at Differential, and that's... ES 2015, thanks. Oh, any questions? Anything? All right. Cool.